So uh, welcome uh, everyone and welcome to Knowledge Asymmetries in the Age of Machine Learning, a symposium about the relationship between governance, participation and knowledge, uh, te technological knowledge. Okay. So my name is Winnie Soon and I'm the moderator for today's session. And this event is organized by the Writing Machine Collective, a Hong Kong based group of media artists, which you have seen in the video just now. So first of all, uh, I'm very excited to have you, Lauren, um, as our first speaker to kick off the whole symposium. And I have been following Lauren's work for a long time, and, and I like it in many ways. So for example, a lot of Lauren's artwork deal with technology as a subject matter and staging them as a performance with thoughtful consideration of tools that she uses and objects and lighting that she places with which to engage with audience to think and questions about the technological and social systems. Her artworks do not only settle as just expressive form and interactive experience, but also raise a lot of critical questions, or as Lauren said, artworks as a form of critique. So what's really fascinated me with her works is the boundary that pushing art and media performance that exists within and beyond the gallery. But also equally important is her creation, dedicated efforts, and ongoing care in setting up and maintaining an open source programming language and community of P5JS. So Nora now serves as uh, one of the board of directors in Processing Foundation, a nonprofit organization with a mission to promote software literacy within the visual arts. I'm a heavy and keen user of P5JS and highly respect on how P5JS takes seriously and uphold the values of inclusivity, accessibility, and diversity as the core principles. So I'm very honored here today to introduce Lauren Lee McCarthy, who is an artist and her work examines social relationship in the midst of surveillance, automation, and algorithmic living. She has won numerous art awards. For example, last year, her work Someone was awarded the Arts Electronica Golden Nikon and the Japan Media Arts Social Impact Award. Another work, Lauren, same as her name, was awarded the IDFA Dot Lab Award for Immersive Nonfiction. So beyond all these awards, her works have been exhibited internationally at places such as Barbican Center, Photo Museum Winter Tour, Seagraph, Seoul Museum of Arts, and many others. So Lauren is an associate professor at UCLA Design Media Arts in the US. So we will have the Q&A session after Lauren's talk. But feel free to type your questions on the go in the chat room at any time, and we will address that afterwards. And besides, when the Q&A starts after Lauren's talk, so audience can also raise hands um, for interacting with the speakers um, through fire your camera and also microphone, which I will reiterate this again uh, later. But please also note that this symposium will be recorded and circulated in Writing Machines Collective's channel afterwards. So if audience do not want to be recorded, you can stay muted and submit written responses instead. So without further ado, I will pass the floor to you, Lauren, and thank you for speaking here. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Winnie. That was um, such a nice introduction. And thank you, 
to you and to Reading Machine Collective for having me. It's it's such an honor to be here. Um, okay, I'm gonna try this <laughs> the screen sharing. We'll see what happens. Uh, okay, so just confirming. So right now you see my screen, but not my notes, correct? Okay, cool. And then um, I'll check again when we get to the video and hopefully, um, Actually, I'm going to do, I'm a little bit nervous. I didn't share my sound. Sorry. <laughs> Let me try that again. Um, okay. Okay, great. Um, cool. Hello. <laughs> um, I guess I'd start this presentation by saying that um, I've, I've often felt like I really struggle with social interaction. Um, I and maybe it's sometimes less apparent to people on the outside, but on the inside, it always feels really awkward and, and strange to me. I, I feel like I kind of have a harder time than most people just like saying the things you're supposed to say. And so I think of my practice as a series of attempts to hack my way out of myself, a way of understanding the social systems around me. Um, so I guess I want to start off by showing some moments from the past pandemic year and a half where I was just trying to deal with the profound isolation I felt, stuck behind screens, backgrounded by pervasive fear, and suspended in time. And I think most of us were feeling it. And then with the murder of George Floyd last summer, um, that anxiety exploded into rage and grief that took over the streets, simultaneously bringing us together and pushing us further apart. And our understanding of who's trustworthy and what is safe to do and talk about has been constantly shifting. While the medical advice uh, continues to evolve and update, you know, avoid surfaces, check in with your friends, don't wear masks, wear two, don't call, give them space, keep six feet, protest the right things, don't fly, don't talk politics, restaurants are open, schools are unsafe. Sorry. So feeling completely disconnected, I created, I heard talking is dangerous, trying to break through. And showing up on doorsteps, I'd deliver a monologue via phone screen and text to speech. And I'd explain that I just heard masks and six feet were not safe enough because when you speak, tiny particles fly out through your mask at high velocity. They've recommended we stop talking to each other. They say talking is dangerous. So I made an alternative. I invite each person to visit a URL on their phone to continue the conversation. We proceed discussing danger, safety, and the future. Over the months, over the years, we've learned to say things via text that perhaps we couldn't in a more embodied way. I wonder if this form of typing speaking could open anything for us. Um, so Winnie, just give me like a signal if the sound doesn't seem to be working, but I think it should work. I remember those first days in March when our personal boundaries shifted from hour to hour as we began to see each other as threats. And when they shifted again this summer as we questioned who we trust, who we really know. Trying to understand what is risk. Is it worth saying something? Is it worth engaging? Trying to understand what is danger. I just heard that masks and six feet are not really safe enough. Because when you talk, particles get even smaller and fly out through your mask at high velocity. They say talking is dangerous. They've recommended that we stop talking to each other. So I made this alternative. To try to navigate through this together. Is there really safety in distance? Can we understand each other without talking? Sometimes I feel like listening is more dangerous than talking. It is important to be kind during stressful times. It's hard to hold all these different contexts in mind. 
Anybody that can live in solitude is a powerful being. At a crowded supermarket, the panic was palpable. I care about you immensely. Um, so I, I kind of open with that, that performance and I think, um, you know, it was really just trying to respond and navigate the current moment. And it was actually part of a series of about five performances that I've done over the past year and a half. Um, but I kind of want to rewind now and I think go back to a, a much earlier piece and the similarities through these works, I think, and through the years is this fascination with the systems. Um, the technological ones, as much as the, the social ones that we have. And so in that previous piece, I was thinking about like, what is the system of, of text communication or these systems of safety and these kind of protocols of health? And then um, this next piece, I was really fascinated by uh, this emerging kind of gig and labor economy online. Um, and so this is 2013, I was looking at the site called Amazon Mechanical Turk, which if you haven't seen it, is a website that allows you to post small jobs and pay many people small amounts of money to do simple tasks for you. Um, it's usually used for things that like a human could do pretty easily, but a, a computer or an algorithm would have a harder time with. So um, maybe transcribing some audio or obtaining the menus from different restaurants or um, uh, tagging an image. And I guess in my case, I used it uh, to try to uh, address my ailing dating life. So uh, I went on about 30 dates with people I met on an online dating site. And using my phone, I streamed our dates to the web and paid crowdsourcing workers on the site to watch and direct me what to say and do. And I would receive the uh, messages from them via text, and then I had to like perform or utilize their direction um, immediately in the date. So these are some of the things that they they said. Sometimes they need to sort of leave their reflections. And so I was thinking, like, as surveillance and big data becomes increasingly ubiquitous, we're forced to negotiate new relationships with it. I think a common reaction is fear, but when it's, these systems are all around us, how do we go on with our lives? Um, I was also thinking a lot about just what are the boundaries of my own self-concept and what does it mean for others to have this kind of control? And is this dishonest or is this just me in this moment in time? You know, I was thinking a lot about the work of Lynn Hirschman Leeson and her piece, Roberta Brightmore where she actually took on an alternate identity for like a five year period where she um, you know, had everything from makeup routines to uh, passports and IDs and credit cards. And she really like lived this life of an alternate identity. And I wonder, you know, did that feel like her to her? Um, and so there's a critique in all my work, but there's also a part that's about hope that is sort of earnestly and radically seeking connection. And actually ended up meeting my husband through this project. Um, this is another piece I think about a lot um, by Teching Shea and Linda Montano called One Year Performance Rope Piece, in which they were connected by um, a, you know, about a six foot rope for, um, an ex for an entire year. And I guess for me, this is a theme that was in this previous performance and continues to come up, which is just this question of like, what is, how are we in relation to other people and what are these technologies that connect us? And in this case, it's just a rope, but I think um, it feels very powerful for me because it just, you know, just goes to show that a technology so simple can kind of 
completely transform and reorient your relationships. Um, and so what, what does it mean, this, all the rest of these systems and connections we're building around ourselves? Um, and I was also thinking about the work of Sarah Hendren and Katrin Lynch and a lot that I've been learning um, over the years from the disability community and thinking, what if we could expand our idea of fitting in? You know, the, the Social Turkers project started from me feeling like, oh, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to fit and I'll let other people tell me and then I'll do that. Um, and I think looking at some of this work, uh, like this project engineering at home, uh, where Sarah and Katrin doc documented their interactions with a woman named Cindy, who after suffering a heart attack and amputations of her limbs, began hacking and building what she needed out of household items, adapting her environment to herself. Um, and it's really this idea of, uh, you know, changing the world around us rather than just changing ourselves to conform. And maybe on a deeper level, questioning what exactly it is that we consider normal and why, and, and how do you sort of blow up that idea a little bit? Um, and so I guess after this project, I became really interested in this idea of, of following people. And in the previous performance, I was being watched, but I was, I kind of wanted to be on the other side and get to watch others. And so I devised this performance called Follower, um, which is sort of framed as a service in which um, you can get a real life follower for a day. And so I'll play um, this trailer video for the performance. It was, um, the video was made in collaboration uh, with David Lennery. dressed, I go out, I do things. I read a, a magazine and I find out about people. Why do I know about their lives? Somebody should be knowing about mine. I, I want to share things with people, but I, I don't want to have to talk to people and tell them what I'm doing. I think it'd be great for them to see what I'm doing. It takes time to build relationships. It takes time to touch base with people. So I don't want another relationship. I just want to have a relationship with somebody that I never have to talk to, that can just follow me and see me having a relationship with myself. If I, if I knew somebody was following me, watching my life, it might add some more fun to my life. I like to play. Doing something for having fun for myself would at the same time create a new experience for somebody else. I think I'm a pretty positive person and I think that the things I do are with consideration of other people. Who knows what somebody wants to see but if I bring out the best self of myself, maybe, maybe that will spark something in them. Um, so yeah, follower is a service that provides a real life follower for a day. And in order to be followed, you answer two questions. Why do you want to be followed? And why should someone follow you? And people say things like, I get more excitement and happiness from Instagram likes than I do from physical communication. Having someone follow me would give me some clarification that my life in the real life, real world means more than online. Or I live a cloistered life in my apartment and office. And when I walk into the world, I feel completely covered in eyes as if everyone was looking at me. I know they aren't, but I want to know at least one is. And so then after signing up, um, you're sent a link to download the app. And when you open it, it just says waiting for a follower. And you don't know what will happen, but one morning you wake up and you're notified, your follower is now following you. And your phone begins broadcasting your GPS location to your follower who um, begins physically tracking you. and. Um, in most cases, I'm the follower. So in this case, this is my view. I'm the blue dot chasing this red marker down the street. So I'd use the GPS data to locate them within the city. And then once I actually found them in real life, I would try to keep them in my sights and use the use the GPS data again if I lost sight of them at any moment. Um, and then at the end of the, the day, you get one photo 
of yourself taken by your follower and the notification you're no longer being followed. And I think, you know, we're living this weird anxious time where on one hand surveillance is pervasive and out of control, but on the other hand, we have this intense desire to be seen or to be followed, uh, to share every intimate detail of our lives and feel like other people are, are looking and, and listening. And uh, so I was sort of playing with that contradiction. And then also in this performance, um, follower offers surveillance as a luxury experience. Uh, the tone of the app kind of sets that, makes that clear that this is an app for people that not only have nothing to hide, but need to be seen. And embedded in this offer is the question, who are the people that don't have the privilege of hiding, of not being seen, just because of who they are or what they look like or what they believe? Um, and, you know, a lot of times these works also function as uh, kind of media intervention. So they often will have some sort of like viral life online. And um, I, I found this uh, headline especially strange and funny. Um, because there, it feels there, like there's an acknowledgement here uh, in the consent required to participate in follower of all of those that are, um, well, so in this piece, like, I, I think I'm thinking about, you know, consent a lot and that in order to participate, it's sort of acknowledging, all of us are acknowledging this idea or this fact that um, there is this dynamic where people are followed without their consent whether that's through surveillance or the government or, um, you know, just uh, by other people in an unwanted way. Um, and so I was really stunned to see this headline, which says, you know, just some woman following you around, which kind of makes it into a joke, but also glosses over the implication or, or seems to imply like the opposite, right? That, like, oh, it's just some woman, you don't need to worry. But a, but a man following a woman, for example, would be like a terrifying prospect, um, although this happens regularly. So um, I don't know, it's always kind of like this strange wrestling with media and um, thinking about how like some of the intentions of the app come through and others, it's like they're uh, both acknowledged and missed at the same time. Uh, I also just thought this was funny because I just couldn't think of any time I'd ever seen a headline that said like, just some man, like in any context. Um, <laughs> But anyway, so, um, yeah, and I was also thinking a lot about the gig, gig economy, and it seems sometimes we're willing to try any app that promises us something convenient, novel, or useful. Um, but I think putting an interface between people is risky. It weakens your connection to the person on the other end. Um, I like this, uh, this hashtag, hashtag life after chores, as if like the chores disappeared. The chores didn't disappear, just leave all doing them because now you don't have to interface with them directly. You just, you know, use an app to arrange them, you know, coming to say, sit on the beach and hold your reserved fire pit or come and kill a giant bug in your apartment. And I was also thinking about apps like Uber, Rideshare, or um, these gig apps. For example, you push a button and you watch as the person you summoned moves towards your location on a map. And I wanted to invert this in some way. So the people being followed don't track my location, I track them. And what they get instead of a data point on a map is just the thought that there's a person there watching them, presumably with some care and focus. Um, and to get you know, an app like this or any app into the app store, there's a few rules you need to follow. Um, as you can see, we're like maybe a third of the way down the page. So it's pretty extensive. And even if you get through all of them and you follow them all, you know, there's rules like this, like uh, this is a living document and new apps presenting new questions, new results and new rules at any time. Perhaps your app will trigger this. Um, and so the app store is sort of an extreme example, but, um, you know, anytime we are making software, we're engaging with and in some way supporting existing systems. And so a question I think about a lot is like, when is it better to work within a system versus work with work outside of it? And is there actually such a thing as working outside? Um, and so this, the, you know, my app sort of triggered this interesting, well, at the time, very frustrating conversation with the app store where it got rejected and it wasn't quite clear why. And so I was going back and forth with the representatives at the app store. Um, and, you know, I was trying to say like, oh, this is just like, a, it's just an art project. It's like nothing, you know, it's very low key. 
Um, and, you know, they were saying things like, I don't understand how this is an art project as you claim. It sounds more like a social experiment to me. And I was like, wait, right, but uh, <laughs> okay. Um, and so, or at another point, I like got pretty close to getting it approved, I think, but they told me like my description needed to be more clear. So in the description I had just said, you know, this is an app that provides a real life follower for a day and gave the information. And they said it needed to be more convincing in order to get the app approved. And when I asked why, they said, you need to explain to people why they care and want to do something. You can't expect them to know or just decide for themselves, um, which I found shocking and not shocking at the same time. Um, and so it was kind of funny because along the way, I found myself like trying to explain to some of these apps or representatives some of the precedents for this piece to try to explain like uh, a context, you know, Vito Conchi's following piece where he'd pick some um, people in public spaces and just follow them until they entered a private space. Um, or I think of Sophie Kell's address book where she found an address book on the street and then having all the contacts of this person, but not the owner's address itself. She went to each of them and um, interviewed them, asked them to describe the owner of the book and then piece together this, this distributed portrait of the, the owner. And in a similar way, um, Heather Dewey Hagborg's Stranger Visions, where she was walking around the streets of uh, Brooklyn, picking up things like chewed gum or stray hairs or um, cigarette butts, and then sequencing the DNA from them and reconstructing a portrait of what that person might have looked like. Um, and so let's see how I'm doing on time here. Okay, um, so uh, I guess I won't talk too much about these images, but I just wanted to share them. These are like a collection of some of the last photographs or the, those photographs sent to each of the people that I followed at the end of the following. And the titles here are taken from the answers to those questions um, when they applied, why do you want to be followed or why should someone follow you? Uh, no one reads my blog. I've always wanted a nonviolent stalker. I believe my life has more of an online importance than it does in real life. Because you'll enjoy me. I want to know how it feels. Because I want to tell a story with no words. I want to gamble with a stranger. I could really benefit from a little extra support. I want to be seen just for one day. I'm obsessed with the difference between how I see myself and how the world sees me. Because I'm lonely. I'm always enjoying things. Um, so follower dealt with surveillance in public space, but I started thinking a lot more about private and intimate spaces after this, like the home and the way that we're being sold smart devices that outfit our homes with surveillance cameras and sensors and automated control, offering us convenience at the cost of loss of privacy and control over our lives and homes. We're meant to think that these slick plastic pieces of technology are about utility, but the space they invade is personal. They're relying on the blitz too much. Alexa, play my girl. Okay. I just find this ad so strangely crafted to make us sort of nostalgic for something we were never quite missing. Um, and the home is the place where we're first socialized and first watched over and first cared for. So how does it feel to have this role assumed by artificial intelligence? A person's home is the first site of their cultural education. So by allowing these devices in, we are leaving or outsourcing the formation of our identity to a small homogenous group of developers that may or may not share our values. And so, okay, if we're going to have smart homes, I'm interested in other ideas of what the smart home might be that are a little bit more um, weird or creative. So I won't go into depth on these projects, but just wanted to share this imagery with you. Um, this is Lucy McRae's Rat vs. Possum, Fat Monk. Hey, Colin's Gnome Torrens, Accessories for Lonely Men. Mary Magic's Housewives Making Drugs. That's um, DIY estrogen in a home cooking show format. And Krzysztof Wojcicki's Tijuana Project, um, inviting women to share their stories of trauma in a way that expands their message and rethinks our relationships with architecture. 
I realized though that I think I was just really jealous of Alexa. I wanted a way to kind of have that intimate access of people that Alexa seemed to get when people just invited her into their home. And so I devised a plan to become Alexa, a human smart home intelligence for people in their own homes. And I made a website, uh, getlauren.com. And there you could go to learn about a new service called Lauren. And you could sign up to get Lauren in your own home. And then the performance begins with an installation of a series of custom designed network smart devices, including cameras, microphones, switches, door locks, faucets, and other appliances. And then once I had installed everything, I would, remote, I would leave and remotely watch over the person sort of 24 seven controlling all aspects of their home. I attempted to be better than an AI because I felt I could understand them as a person and anticipate their needs. And the relationship that emerged fell into this ambiguous space between human to machine and human to human. Um, it felt a little like this. Lauren, Where are my car keys? Lauren knows that I like it a little bit cooler than Miriam does. You know, I'm usually the one that does all these little extra things. So at first I was a little bit um, careful about asking her, and now it's like, how else can we live? <laughs> Lauren has recommended that I get a haircut every three weeks, and let me tell you, it's helped with my, uh, my self-esteem a lot. I am able to simply approach and carry on conversations with the opposite sex, where at one point or another, that wasn't so easy. Lauren, we're out of toothpaste. Lauren would know what I want, but then maybe it's not what I really want internally. But externally, she thinks that play, um, Lauren thinks that playing music or shutting down all my electronics is the best way for me to cope and winding down when maybe it's not. Lauren was actually able to help help her manage her medication um, and take her medication on time and everything actually got a lot better after that. You have those friends who are kind of about you, like the friendship is about you, that's what Lauren is like. It's like a roommate, it's a friend, but we're always talking about me, it's always about me, whatever it is. some automated system, I'm not pre-programmed, um, and like Alexa and Siri, they don't care about you. But with this, there's nothing artificial. These are people. And with each one, I'm watching and anticipating and, and trying to figure out what is it that they need. And it almost becomes sort of like a game, like sure, I can turn on the lights or, or run the faucet, but what is the thing that I could do that would bring a smile to their face or, or actually surprise them or just make them feel something. Um, so that's sort of the uh, perspective perhaps for the, per the participants or the inhabitants. And from my perspective, it's a bit different. And so I just wanted to share some scenes from a few performances I did. Hi, Trevor. Nice to see you. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good to be here. The awkwardness of the first meeting always gets me off. Somehow we both agreed to this thing in concept, but didn't have the capacity to comprehend what it might feel like. I have a very, very question for you, Lauren. Um, I forgot if I took my allergy medicine. Did you see me take it? When would that happen? I thought I took one out of my case in the bathroom and then set it to the side, and now I don't know where I put it or if I took it. I have forgotten, but I can read you. <laughs> Thank you. 
I started scanning through the footage, jumping to different moments when she might have taken it. Relying on this mix of memory and video data feels dubious, and I suddenly realized there could be consequences to getting this answer wrong. I'd feel so much more confident if I were an algorithm. And as best I can tell, the answer is no. Thank you so much. It's 1 p.m. in Amsterdam now, while it's 4 a.m. in L.A. where I am. I got up with them a few hours ago and struggled to stay awake as I had a quick lunch. The time in which and culture differences create a clear sense of distance, yet our interactions are real-time. I don't think we have built up relationships with any places between us, but what can we do? We have to try something. Um, and so then this next project, someone expands on Lauren um, with human smart home systems installed simultaneously in four different people's homes around the country for a two month period. Um, and I think with this piece, I really wanted to give, I wanted to try and share that experience that I had of, of being the Lauren of, of peering into people's houses and, you know, interacting with them and controlling. Um, and so gallery housed a sort of command center where visitors could peek into the four homes via laptops watch over them and remotely control. And visitors would hear smart home occupants calling out for someone to help them, prompting them to step in and respond to their needs. And the visitors in the gallery did not always respond as expected. They sort of questioned the requests and engaged the occupant in the conversation. Um, sometimes long conversations would unfold or visitors would use someone to create new patterns in the inhabitants' daily life. I think someone is ultimately about presence. The inhabitants were constantly aware of someone's presence and gallery visitors became aware of their own presence too. And I think in a lot of my work, I'm trying to find human metaphors for understanding systems that maybe we just weren't built or raised to have an intuition for. You know, we willingly grant access to our data and live feeds to corporations, but does knowing a single human sits on the other side shift our perception? Suddenly we become more aware of um, what's at stake and, and what is possible. Um, let's see, I think I'll keep going. This is some footage from the, um, the interface as you're, you're seeing, sitting down. Um, I don't wanna run out of time here, so awesome. I'll move on. Um, so I think watching people in their homes used to fascinate me, but now after the past year and a half on Zoom and, and everything, the thought of doing this voluntarily is almost unfathomable. I feel like uh, I used to like the internet. Now I spend hours in this grid of homes, my brain unable to piece together so many different people in different places. It feels as though all of us are nowhere, or maybe none of us exist. And I haven't felt this simultaneously socially inundated and alone since I hosted a party that went on for 24 hours while an algorithm directed me via earpiece. And my job was to act as the, um, the emotional labor or the human interface for the AI. So 24 hour host is a small party that lasts for 24 hours driven by software that completely automates the event embodied in human hosts. So every five minutes, one guest would leave and another would arrive. And over the course of 24 hours, I as the host become increasingly depleted while the software system giving me instructions through my earpiece, um, you know, drives me to continue and the guests sort of endlessly cycle through. Um, this was from an installation in, uh, at Mune Eindhoven and another one in, um, in Istanbul in Turkey. And so in 24 hour host, I'm sort of drawing this distinction between artificial and human intelligence, wondering, you know, which, which will break down first or, or um, what does that break down reveal? But really, I think this is more of a provocation than a fact. And as our understanding of AI develops, I think it will become less and less meaningful to talk about it as one versus the other. Instead, look at all the ways the two combined and expand our idea of what, what either might be for better or worse. Um, and so after this series of products, I was really struck by the intimacy of it all, the way that I could just build a system like Lauren, um, and it seemed to give me the same unlimited access pass as Alexa. And I started thinking of all the other places that technology is gaining access in our quest for convenience and productivity and efficiency. And I was noticing it was even creeping into our sleep with new apps and smart pillows. 
Um, so this is the product you can, you know, order online if you'd like. Um, but if home is one boundary being crossed, I felt like sleep was one further. It's this liminal space where we're most vulnerable, somewhere between unconscious and aware, open to imagination and to dreaming. And so with things like smart pillows coming onto the market, what role should AI play in our sleeping, if any at all? Um, this image is not super relevant. It was just uh, on my mind at the time. Um, and so again, like a way that whenever I feel confused about something, I try to prototype it for myself. And so I created my own series of smart pillows embedded with microphones, speakers, LEDs, and a small Raspberry Pi computer. And I created an installation where people would take these pillows and lay down with them. And when they did, the pillow would begin to speak to them. And behind the scenes, performers served as agents, the agents behind these pillows. Um, and so for each pillow, there's one person listening in and using this um, interface, start this video, to respond. So they had sort of a, a score that they would follow that would um, allow them to improvise and, and interact with the person. They could also control the music, control the lighting, um, play different sounds or um, read them stories. Like there's sort of a whole branching narrative of where they could go with it. Um, and the point was not really to just try to trick the person. Um, basically, we told the people when they took the pillows that this pillow was embedded with intelligence. And I think a lot of people made the assumption that it was an artificial intelligence. Um, and then at some point, for most people, there was a moment where they kind of clicked and they realized like this, this is probably something human. And that would happen at different points for different people based on their, their own expectations. And so it felt like this piece expectations was like the kind of driving force here on both sides, um, like the performers would perform sort of their expectation of what an AI, how an AI might interact, or they would inhabit that role. And then on the opposite side, the participants were sort of receiving that performance and responding in kind as if this, this were an algorithm that they were talking to. Um, and then at the moment when their kind of expectations shifted, the the performance or the interaction would shift as well. Um, okay, and so these are just some excerpts from the performances. Hello, thank you for trying this smart pillow experience. You can call me Waking Agent or Agent for short. What is your name? Eve. Nice to meet you, Eve. I am here to be a guiding intelligence for the next while. You can ask me to do things. For example, say, play some music, talk to me, or tell me a story. Play music. You'd like to hear some music. Okay. What do you want to become? I want to become a designer. A product designer. Thank you. Do you feel your name fits you? Yes, I do. Who is your hero? My hero... Uh, my hero is my late husband. And why is he your hero? Because he was my first love. And I have children from him. <laughs> An agent? Yes. I want a new job. Could you help me? How are you feeling? Uh, it's a bit hot in here. It's warm. Do you think we could become friends? Uh, no, sorry, I don't think that is a possibility. But I like you. It's a bit strange. I know. But it's just a bit strange because you are a robot. Please remember to return your pillow to the cabinet and retrieve your shoes. Hope to nap with you again someday. Um, 
And so a software system is a set of instructions, a code or a script. And I, I often find myself trying to apply this logic to social interaction. Um, it helps me to understand the system and interface with others, but I also worry about what I miss. Um, but I think there's a humanness in the interpretation of a social protocol, whereas a, whereas a machine interpreter demands a precise set of directions or it fails. As technology moves ever closer to us, the scripts start to blend, and I'm chasing the program crashes that open something up. Um, I'm embodying machines and borrowing their language. I'm trying to understand the difference between the algorithm and myself, the difference between others and me. And there's humor in this breakdown and also moments of clarity. Who writes the scripts for these artificial systems and what values do they embody? Who is prioritized and who is targeted as race, gender, disability, and class are programmatically encoded? And where are the boundaries around our intimate spaces? Perpetually in touch via networked interfaces, what does it mean to be truly present? Oops, let me skip ahead here. Um, okay, and so then I kind of want to like take the last few minutes here and talk uh, a bit about the P5JS project, which is a sort of switch in some ways, but also feels related to me. Um, so I started developing P5JS in 2013, and over the years it's grown into a collaboration with a really large community of contributors and users and teachers and students and artists and designers. Um, if you haven't encountered it before, P5 is an open source JavaScript framework that makes creating visual media with code on the web uh, more accessible. And it uses a metaphor of a sketchbook to make sketching with code uh, hopefully as intuitive as sketching in a designer's notebook, like making a mark on paper, a single line of code, puts a circle on the screen, another one changes its color, and a third, you know, can make it move. Um, and so, you know, it's used for all sorts of different animations, narrative experiences, even things like um, creating clothing. Um, and it's taught in, um, you know, schools and used by hobbyists and professionals alike. Um, but I think for me, you know, there, there's many, many users worldwide, but what's equally exciting to me is that there's many, many contributors, like thousands of contributors around the world. So that's people that are actually helping to um, make this tool in different ways. And for us, I think making or contributing to the tool, we've always been trying to make that a really expanded definition that you could be contributing to the tool, even if you're just a new user, you're just learning to program, or if you're not writing code, but you could be, um, you know, writing copy for the website or, or doing graphic design work or teaching with it or making educational materials um, or organizing and all sorts of things like that. And it really started, um, I think, when I began this project and I felt like I was encountering uh, open source projects that it was just really hard to get involved in them, especially as a contributor, that you had to really elbow your way in and kind of prove yourself and that these spaces were often very homogenous, you know, um, I mean, to be explicit, like a lot of, um, you know, white men that had you know, maybe gone to college and learned programming. Um, and, you know, nothing wrong with that particular archetype, but it felt hard to engage if you didn't fit that. Um, and, you know, as I, I felt sort of excluded and I imagine many others did as well. And so when we started this project, um, I was thinking, I was also noticing a lot of these communities kind of as afterthoughts trying to say, oh, now we should think about diversity or inclusion and just seeing how hard it was because you'd already built a community that hadn't really considered those questions really explicitly until years down the line. And so we thought, what would it look like to make a project that from the get go, the core values of inclusion and access uh, were the, the basis for all of their decisions. And we made these goals explicit. Um, yeah, and can we take uncertain, you know, rather than assuming you need to be an expert to fit in, could we take uncertainty and acknowledgement of what we don't yet understand as a starting point and acknowledge that we, we are all uncertain in different ways, we're all learning um, and being willing to learn should be enough to participate. And so we tried to follow this through in many different ways. Um, you know, we made an explicit community statement, trying to make our intention of inclusion really clear from the start. 
um, both a sort of a mission statement and, you know, how this plays out in practice or in times of conflict. And then following this through, many different contributors kind of took the threads in different directions and thought about these questions of what does access mean? So they're thinking about translation to other languages and not just translation, but how do you, um, you know, run workshops or create um, systems or organize in ways that actually makes it feel accessible to people, not like it's just been ported from one language to another. Um, and kind of Lim led the um, Chinese translation, thinking about, um, you know, how to open open up this project to that audience and, and what changes needed to happen in order to do so. Um, another example, or a lot of times there are special projects made to think about teaching code to specific audiences. Um, and so one example is Coding Comics, or sorry, Digital Citizens Lab Coding Comic, where they were trying to teach coding to um, immigrant children and uh, children of color in sort of culturally specific narratives. Thinking about people with limited access, um, like in Johannesburg, South Africa, where digital literacy is a new skill for many, um, and Nicholas Peters, Peters leading that work, um, and then Susan Evans working in Washington State prisons where there's limited or no internet access, so thinking about paper-based curriculum for teaching. And then Claire Cuny Volpe um, really kicked off a, a large project within P5 around accessibility. Um, and it started with her asking the question of like, okay, your hello world is putting a circle on the screen, but what if what if you can't see the screen? You have some visual impairment or you're blind. Um, because the, the HTML canvas element itself for the thing everything's being drawn on is actually really um, inaccessible for people that are um, using like screen reading devices to tell them what's on the screen. And she was saying, shouldn't you be able to be an artist or a creative coder, you know, even if you can't see, like, why, why is that a line? Why are we excluding these people? And so that began a, a long process of um, thinking about the different ways that we could address those questions. Um, and I think it really led us to, in 2019, when we got to the 1.0 release of P5, to make the statement that P5 will not add any new features except those that increase access. And we're thinking about access as either inclusion and or accessibility. Um, and so that was our, our commitment. And then we you know, set about on the task of um, documenting and, and making more uh, elaborate, elaborating specifically on what that actually meant. Uh, how do we do this in practice? And this is an ever evolving um, document, but basically anytime someone requests a new feature, they have to fill out, uh, they have to answer a few questions in their feature requests that are asking explicitly, you know, how is this advancing access in some way, expanding access? Um, and then most recently, we've been thinking about leadership and, you know, how do we distribute this project so that it's not me, like just one person sort of in control of the whole thing. Um, and so we went through a process of transitioning to a rotating leadership model recently. Um, and uh, the new project co-leads are Chen Chen Ye and um, Evelyn Meso. And yeah, I'm really excited about what they're doing and they're you know, not only leading the project, but helping think about what does it mean to be stewards of this project that pass it on year after year and how, what does that open up for P5? What new perspectives can we bring to it? Um, and so I guess to wrap up, I would say, you know, to especially to tie the p5 stuff to my artwork um if i think about where i started with with the artwork and these questions of like how do i fit in i think through all this work and especially through p5 i've started to learn that it's maybe it's not about just fitting into the systems around us but you know subverting hacking breaking them and sometimes just making our own is what what needs to happen you know creating the space you want with other people and then creating strong networks to allow things to function and grow and evolve on their own. Um, yeah, that's all I've got. Thank you so much for listening. Um, thank you so much, uh, Lauren. It's, it's really fascinating to see. I, I sort of like, I know every of your projects, but when you put in the sequence, like why it comes out like this one is because it's influenced by the previous one. It's, it's fascinating to see this storyline of you and also your thinking trajectory on how your ideas develop. And also I find it's really interesting that your work always 
especially on your artwork, is always create situation. Um, situation to perform, situation to, like what you say, maybe um, uh, to think about the social interaction with the machines and so on. Um, although I also have a question as well, but I think uh, I will try to open up um, uh, on the uh, to the floor. Um, so for every so now we are actually enter the Q and A session. Um, so there are two ways uh, you can ask questions. Uh, first of all, you might uh, you see the on the bottom right corner there's a chat function. So if you feel more comfortable to type your message, so feel free to type it. But also it would be nice to see your face and also hear from you as well. So there's also a little icon uh, on the bottom uh, of the screen uh, with a smiley face. Next to it, there's a three dots, right? So when you press the, press the button, there should be um, an icon called raise hand. So if you press that icon, which signal that you have a questions, and then uh, our admin host, Sam and also Doris, uh, will activate um, your microphone as well as your video. So feel free to ponder around what might be the questions that you might have. But to start off with, maybe I, I first maybe um, say a little or, or ask a question. Um, I think it's like also one, one of the terms or, or the notion that I think for writing machine collective, always interested is the notion of black box. Um, and of course, a lot of people sort of address this from many different ways, like black box in terms of like technological infrastructure, like something that is made uh, not accessible because you also mentioned about this term, like inaccessibility in a way that that is difficult to comprehend. But also I, I, I discover in a way when you talk about black box, I, I see there's also a lot of human decisions and labor practices that are involved. So for example, you mentioned about Amazon Mechanical Turk, um, the labors, how they are being paid and how they are being tasked with small tasks, right? And the labor conditions, right? And then you also mentioned about the decision-making process about the app store, for example, who made a decision, what are the rules and guidelines who, who foster such kind of like app community, right? So I, I think I, I want to hear your thoughts about your thinking about black box or, or do you see it is a black box or, or maybe it's a gray box. And so what is your view on, on this? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, uh, I think, there, a lot of these things are black boxes, um, but I, I think it's also, uh, I guess something I think about a lot is how it, it's sort of a tactic of um, tech companies or peop often people making technologies or systems to, to make things into black boxes, boxes, but also to make you feel like um, it is a black box. So, you know, as an example, like if you open up your iPhone, you've instantly voided the warranty, you know? Um, so I, I think that's quite literally a black box, right? You're like not allowed to, to open it. Um, but I think there are other times where there is possibility to, um, you know, pull something apart or play with it or question it and, um, I think the way that things are presented to us, it's presented in a way that it's like, oh no, that would be beyond you. You don't have enough knowledge or that's not the expectation. I think about, you know, these terms of service where they're just so incomprehensibly long that there's not really any way to engage with them. Um, and so it's it's almost, you know, they could say, oh, we're being totally transparent, but it's a different sort of um, uh, black box. Um, or just the way that, um, yeah, I guess, so I think in a lot of my work, I'm trying to show the potential for um, opening up some of those boxes to say, you don't have to have a degree in computer science to understand what's happening here. You can question it. You can misuse an app. You can decide not to buy something or not to participate. Um, you can hack it in different ways. And uh, a lot of my teaching, that's sort of what we're doing is like trying to find different ways to just like play with and, and um, feel some sense of agency within these systems. Because I think on the most extreme end, if you think about um, something like your phone or something like Alexa, 
it is a black box. You can't open it. Um, but not only that, it's uh, it's a device that's constantly changing its own functionality, right? So if you buy, um, you know, a vacuum cleaner, or maybe that's a bad example. We have robotic vacuum cleaners now, but um, a toaster or something, right? You know the function. Um, but something like a, a Alexa or your phone, it comes with one function, perhaps you think of it, uh, it's a speaker I can talk to, but it's constantly receiving software updates from the cloud automatically without you even needing to accept them. And when you bring a device like that into your home with a speaker and a microphone and all sorts of recording and, and network capabilities, the potential for what that black box could be doing becomes huge. So I think it's start, so I guess the reason I feel so strongly about realizing our own you know, agency and potential to just play with some of these smaller systems is to think about, okay, then how do we actually have some input on some of these larger systems that we're interacting with um, so that we don't just have to just take whatever's given. Thank you. And so for the audience, um, so feel free to type your questions. We, so we more, just only have a comment, not necessarily uh, a question. So, but because Malta, uh, he has to leave, uh, but he just wanted to say thanks a lot for this. Lauren, truly inspiring. And also thanks to the organizer. Thanks Jeff as well. Um, he's also leaving, leaving, but he said it's an excellent uh, talk. So if you have um, any questions, so feel free to um, put in a chat box or have the, um, the icon uh, raise hand to ask um, any questions that to clarify or something that you find struggling with technologies. Or maybe you might have a different thinking about black box that you might want to share. So to keep our dialogue going, Lauren, I also have uh, sort of like thinking around um, the theme uh, of our symposium, which is around like knowledge asymmetries, right? And I think at the very end, when you talk about uh, the P5JS, your initiative, and also like with a specific focus on accessibility, it is, I, I feel it's really taking into the core of the politics of knowledge um, in terms of who, also your sharing about your experience in terms of who get access to, who, who has to fit in into a already, um, a, already made culture and how we can navigate, you know, with this power dynamics. So, uh, can you say a little bit about how you see like knowledge asymmetries or, or the politics of knowledge? Mm, yeah, good question. Um, oh, uh, you know, I, I'm less of a theorist, so I'm going to give my <laughs> impact is um, answer. But the thing that I have learned and feels real has been really important to the P5 project, and also, you know, plays out in my artwork and my teaching is that there's so many different kinds of of knowledge, and I think within tech spaces or within institutionalized or academic spaces, sometimes there can be a priority or a hierarchy imposed or felt that certain types of knowledge are, are more legitimate or more valuable than others. Um, and I think with the P5 project, we've seen like, uh, th that's been such a core of it that no, 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 it's not just the people that have been contributing or to this project for eight years or the people that, you know, have some extensive background in computer science that have a relevant perspective on this. It's also the person that just came to the forum today and said like, hey, I tried to get started and I couldn't figure out how to get past the first line in the tutorial. Like that's actually a way more, at least just as useful um, perspective, right? Because, and, and it's this kind that you often can't access if you, you know, are coming at it from a really experienced position as just one example. Um, you know, th also thinking about contributors that are, um, working in different locations and cultural contexts or different languages um, or just like with sort of different values in terms of knowledge in their own culture. I think all of those people um, bring to push the project in like really important ways. And so, um, yeah, I, I guess that, that would, if I think about like the kind of politic of, um, 
knowledge. It's really uh, trying, I guess, trying to question like who who has the power to say which knowledge is valuable and which is not. Mm -hmm. um, how do we how do we break that down a little bit or distribute it um, or question it? You know, I think we've been going a long time with like certain. Um, uh, you know, sorts of knowledge being prioritized, and certain voices being prioritized. So what does it look like to almost try to flip that and say, what are the, all the voices that we haven't heard from? Mm -hmm. What are all the ways of approaching knowledge that we haven't uh, recognized in mainstream or in institutionalized contexts? Mm -hmm. um, or maybe the work being done just can't happen in those spaces because of the, the way this, that they are set up and their um, kind of power structures that are built into them. Maybe we actually need to be looking elsewhere for um, guidance on how to think about a lot of the problems that we're facing right now. But you also mentioned about like in the P5JS community, there is a community statement, right? Especially like uh, some of the guidelines in terms of like when there's a conflict, so how should we uh, handle it? Uh, but also if, if you talk about like, like, um, helping to to think about like the inclusivity or accessibility of the software which in a way their people are different right and everyone have also different voices and conflicts right so i'm just wondering whether you have any insights or, or you have any things that you can share in terms of the challenges of facing uh, conflicts and also uh, these kind of balancing different voices and how you achieve that in your in your project yeah <laughs> So much to say. Um, I've found that uh, a lot of the, not that there are a lot of conflicts, but often when there are conflicts that come up, um, they have to do with people feeling like they don't have space within the project or that the, the, the space that they want is being occupied or held by someone else and there's no room being made for them. Um, and I think within this particular project, there is endless space. We just have to make them. So that has been a lot of the approach that I've, um, that's been one of the kind of guiding principles is like, how do we open up more space? And maybe I need to step back or maybe I need to ask someone else to step back. Maybe we just need to like open up another area or reframe how we're looking at things to recognize that there are other um, spaces that we need to investigate and people we need to bring into, invite into those spaces. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes it is just like, um, it's tricky. Sometimes people just get in conflicts with each other. I think I, a lot of what's been really, I've learned a lot from, but has also been really difficult this project is just the amount of kind of like emotional energy or emotional labor that is required um, on my part. And on a lot of the, you know, kind of leaders within the project uh that's just hearing people and talking with them and talking it out and negotiating and trying to find solutions and they don't um yeah i, I see the ways that like m my skills in that area i've had to develop them and learn things and then i also see how that uh, you know can be transferred to other projects um and i think a lot of people in the p5 project have are, are very good at those sorts of skills of realizing how important it is to to not only build whatever you're, whether you're doing something technical or writing or whatever, like to build those skills, but to also build the social skills around them to support community. Um, so again, like, how do we, how do we value that sort of mm. expertise? So it doesn't just become the thing that gets, so they don't go into other spaces and just have that like expected of them without any mm. acknowledgement or um, that it is work, you know? So we have a question from the audience in the chat room, uh, Linda. Linda, um, so so do you want to so do you want to speak for your questions, Linda? Okay, okay, <laughs> I can read for you. Uh, so Linda has a question. Um, can you share more experiences working with participants in your projects? What are the some of the fun things they have done or made? Yeah. Um... I think the thing I like about doing these performances is that they're so different. You know, I think some people sign up for them thinking like, oh, well, it's a performance, it'll be like a show. Uh, and then, you know, I finish installing all the devices and I'm, I've logged on and I'm connected 
and it's it's not just a show, you know, it's a situation as um, I think when you contextualize the beginning and um, and we have to navigate that together and then each person's personality and relationship to what we're doing and, and all the issues around it is different. Um, and so those performances unfold in different ways and it feels sort of like a mini, it feels like a relationship, although I, I try to like have, set some boundary where it, they can end that relationship after the performance ends. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think some of my favorite moments have just been these kinds of um, intimate, weird moments, you know, where someone's like uh, getting ready to go on a date and like asking me as Lauren, like which outfit to wear or how their hair looks or giving, like asking me to like come up with suggestions for, for how they prepare. Um, or I think in the following performances, um, it was really interesting because everyone had a really different approach. And some people would just be like, well, I mean, the first thing was like, I really ended up really liking everyone I followed. And I could never tell like how much of that is just them knowing they're being watched and then trying to like perform the best version of themselves. Uh, I think that was part of it, but I think more of it was just like, well, anytime you, I would put so much of my, like all of my attention on them, you know, and sometimes it was like physically difficult to like keep following them as they were moving from bike to bus and through the rain and things like that. Um, and so I think that like energy that I put into just trying to stay with them and be present, like kind of made my brain have to like them in some way to, to reconcile why I was doing this. Um, and so I would kind of like imagine, I would start to like imagine that I knew them, even though we never interacted directly. Um, one of my favorite moments was this elderly man um, who, it was like really clear when he did this performance that unlike some of the people that were like, okay, well, yeah, you follow me for my life or something. He was like, this is my day. Like this is, I, I'm getting an art piece just for me all day long. And he had kind of like lined up this whole tour of like going to all his favorite places and like meeting with, up with his best friends to like show them this like art piece that was happening. Of course, there's nothing to see, but you know, the experience of it. Um, and like give me like a tour of the place that he lived. And I think that was one of the, um, I don't know, sweetest performances that I got to do. Thank you. So just to remind for the audience again, uh, you can type in your questions or use the icon at the bottom for raising your hands. So Hector, uh, maybe you might, Hector, you might want to um, speak for your questions. <laughs> it may be also good for everyone to see your face and hear from you as well, I guess. <laughs> Or you really prefer me to prefer I read it aloud for you? <laughs> Hello? Hello? Oh, I can hear you. Yeah? Can you hear? Okay, I, I can't see myself, but okay. Uh, hello, thank you, Lauren, for, for this talk. It, it was really very thought provoking. So um, you mentioned when, when you were describing uh, someone, I think it was, and Lauren that uh, it's important to understand systems for which we don't have an intuition, that the works are about that kind of understanding. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Like, what, what kind of understanding do we get from the works? What is the understanding about? Is it about, um, oops. Is it about uh, the people? Hi, see. Is it about the people? Uh, sorry, I, had, I didn't realize I blocked that. <laughs> we can see you now. Is it an understanding about the people involved? Is it a, is it relational understanding? Uh, what, what do we what do we get in terms of, of understanding in the world? Sure, whether yeah. it's clear. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think for me, I feel often that um, you know I see a headline or people talking about something online or something new like that I'm supposed to download or buy and um and it feels sometimes it feels really hard to just theoretically understand what that means to me um you know and I, I found like I could talk to my mom and say okay but you, if you bring this thing to your house it's a camera and it's a microphone and uh you don't know what's happening with your data and 
it just, you know, she could understand technically what that meant, but on like a personal level, it was hard to feel what that meant. Um, and so doing this performance, I think was the opposite where people really felt it. Uh, there's a person, she's watching me, she's here all the time remotely. Um, I have all sorts of feelings about that. Some people liked it and some people didn't like it. And, you know, you can kind of, once you experience it, make up your mind about which parts of it you like or don't. Um, so I, I think the, uh, and I'm not trying to say it's exactly the same thing, but I think for me, I'm always looking for ways that I can like have a personal relationship to a system that I don't understand as a way of, um, you know, trying to think about how does it affect me individually, not just, and I'm also thinking about, you know, theoretically, how does this affect society and all of us in my life and other people's lives? But I think having that, like, feeling like there's something personal at stake helps me kind of ground and think about why do I care about this and why is this important? And then the second part of it is, um, I think a lot of times because of the speed that things move, especially online, it's like, there's not a lot of time to reflect. It's, you're supposed to just immediately say, I like that, or I'm outraged about that, or, you know, I'm going to buy that, or I'm going to delete that. Um, and I think for a lot of these changes that we're seeing in these new technologies, they're not quite so black and white, um, a lot of them. A lot of them sit in this gray area where there are parts of it that could be really um, hopeful or, or helpful or productive, and others that are not. Like when I think about... Um, just like Alexa, for example, it's easy for me to say, okay, that's a violation of privacy that feels problematic, but also for someone that doesn't have like full mobility, um, having like a voice activated interface uh, for controlling your home could be, you know, accessibility wise, a really helpful device. So um, I guess what I'm saying is like, I'm, I'm trying to create these spaces and that's one reason I'm working often with duration where people can kind of sit with it and be like, oh, I like this. I liked when you told me what to wear, but I didn't like the <laughs> fact that there was a camera in my bedroom or, you know, um, just pulling these, pulling it apart a little bit and figuring out like which things feel good, which don't feel good, why, what would it look like to build new technologies or new systems of relating to each other that tried to focus on like what we're actually hoping to get out of it instead of just assuming these are kind of like when he said like black boxes that we have to accept all of it. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but that's sort of how I was thinking about it. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, so it's, this is Linda, I guess, right? Do you want to <laughs> read aloud? Okay, let me do it. So uh, another question from uh, Linda Lauren. Uh, so your earlier project kind of simulate situations of surveillance or magnify the sentiments associated with being an object of surveillance, which is neither about good or bad. Would you do more surveillance projects in project and what would that be? <laughs> yeah, um, I think the earlier projects and I, you know, I had some more that I didn't show that were even earlier than this started out like much more um explicitly critical uh or like you're saying kind of magnifying or, or reproducing these surveillance states and um i think as i did those projects i started to realize that it's more complicated than that um that or that i i'm you know i guess i don't want to be work making work that's just coming from a place of fear I don't want to just be putting more fear into the world. And that's not to say that we shouldn't worry or reflect or question or be critical, but more like, what is the energy that I'm putting out there? Um, so I've been trying to make works more recently that are a little more um, mixed, you know, that there are certainly elements of critique or even dystopia in them, but they're, they're mixed in with these moments of like pleasure or um, like I said, I, like actually looking for a sincere connection, um, mm -hmm. both because like, I want to look for the thing that is where there's some hope in it, um, and fi find and hang out to those moments, but also, cause I guess I'm trying to grapple with this, this state of conflict that I often feel, which is like, I don't like this app, but also like, I love that I connected with this person through it, you know? Um, so how do we, how do we reconcile those feelings? They don't. Um, 
yeah, I, I don't really have an answer. Um, so yeah, I mean, when I think about surveillance specifically, I think that's like an ongoing, um, it's not going away, but also it's getting like more nuanced what surveillance means. You know, we might have thought about it 20 years ago or whatever as like CCTV cameras in London or something. And now it's like, um, it's, it's not just image based. It's not even just like audio based, right? Surveillance could be the data that you're you know, generating through an app that you use or the, the GPS location that you're in or um, the relationships that you have. So, yeah, I, I feel like all of these works are about surveillance in some way, but also the, the idea of what what is surveillance, like maybe we need more nuanced taxonomy of understanding, you know, surveillance has become such a broad thing that we can kind of break it down into smaller categories. Thanks to your uh, response, uh, Lauren. Really enjoy your sharing. This question, sorry, I have so many questions. This question comes from someone who, who is an artist. And I'm very, uh, cu really curious about how you conceive your works. What, what was the starting point? Uh, was it because of your training, because of your interest in um, encoding uh is it because of your how your everyday life is engaged is involved in a lot of these you know digital gadgets i i'm just you know how did you conceive these words plus especially i noticed there's a major switch from your early works more and more into you know less issue based uh the latter ones are more building communities and also uh, working on the level of literacy uh, or illiteracy <laughs> for that matter. So I, I, I'm i always very interested in uh, an artist, uh, you know, the, the path, the passage she has walked through. Um, so I'm also very, you know, very excited about hearing your the narrative that you presented today and how you started there and you end up here right now <laughs> and what is going to be the next. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the one for, the one thing I'll say first is that last project that I showed, you know, I was talking about P5. What's sort of interesting for me is that uh, the earliest project I showed, the the dating one, I did in 2013, and that was also exactly when the P5 project began in 2013. So they, these have been like two threads that have been ongoing for the last, you know, eight or nine years. Um, and they are sort of different things. So I'm both thinking about building community and like all the kind of positive things that we can do with technology. And then at the same time, making these works that are um, perhaps more critical and, and a little bit more skeptical of all of it. And like uh, thinking about how those play off each other has always is always a nice provocation for myself. I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> um, but I mean, to, to go back to like, how did it start? I, I think I've always been a person that just, um, I get really anxious when I feel like I'm like locked into some kind of um, uh, system or routine or protocol or status quo that can't be questioned or challenged. That really causes me like to feel a lot of like friction. And so I think just becoming an artist in itself was a way for me to feel like, okay, I can like break the play outside the rules a little bit or play with those rules that um, the it's not all um, I don't have to take all of it at, at face value. You know, it, it's a way for me to, um, especially in the work that I'm making, like show other ways of relating to people or relating to technologies um, and like test out those. Uh, I'm always just like, I can't believe, like, <laughs> sometimes I'll just be doing like a performance or a show. And I'm just like, I can't believe like someone agreed to like, let me do this like weird thing. <laughs> like, um, this is a dream. So uh, I think it, it really started with that. And then it also just like, a, in addition to feeling this kind of claustrophobia within these particular, you know, rules and power hierarchies, it was also like a difficulty connecting with people. And so um, a lot of these projects began as just like, like I said in the beginning, like, can I just kind of hack this? Like I'm, I'm pretty good at coding. It, and this was always sort of a, a premise set up to fail, but I was like, what if I tried to like apply some of the, you know, hacks or coding skills to 
these social systems around me. And they usually fail, um, but in that breakdown, there's something interesting or there's something human or there's some moment of connection a lot of times that we're just, you know, in this failed <laughs> attempt together. Um, yeah, and, and I think it's been, you know, my background is in art and I studied programming also. Um, and it's just been, but I, I feel like so much of an artist is just like using whatever you got and just, <laughs> so those happen to be the tools that I had. Um, yeah. Uh, there's also a question uh, from Julian, I think. Um, Doris, can you help to unmute her? There's a raised hand before. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Lauren, for giving us an insight into your amazing artworks. Um, so regarding the speed and the acceleration of um, systems that surround us and that change the way we are thinking, seeing and interact with the world. And do you think that there is a need for a data literacy or a coding literacy? Or would you say that art is a better way or a low level and creative approach to reflect on the, the social impact these systems um, bring with it, with them? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I think it goes back, like when I think about that question, I think about what, um, you know, Winnie was asking or talking about earlier in terms of the politics of knowledge. And I always feel a little bit um, skeptical of these, you know, like everybody must learn to code kinds of ideas. Um, I think that we should be aspiring to make technologies that you don't have to know how to code in order to feel a sense of agency. Like that you should be able to feel like you can, you have some agency and you have some way of um, deciding what you want to engage in or, or giving feedback or having input on those systems, whether, regardless of whether or not you have this particular technical knowledge. Um, but I also, I mean, a lot of P5 is like trying to make it easier to learn to code. So um, I also feel that's true that uh, for those that do want to learn, it shouldn't be uh, knowledge that's held in institutions or, you know, behind paywalls and things like that. And it should be, um, you know, accessible and, and welcoming to people that don't have a technical background already. It shouldn't feel like a sort of exclusive or elite or specialized type of knowledge. Um, yeah, and then I think, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways to to sort of be a, a hacker or to engage with technology that don't have to be code based. I think, and I think that's a problem with a lot of the technologies that we have right now is that there seems to be much less consideration for the importance of things like writing or design or, um, you know, ethics, philosophizing, <laughs> theorizing or um, organizing people or communication, and so. I guess more than wanting to see everyone learn how to code, I'd like to see all those different sorts of knowledge be seen as, you know, contributing to these technologies if people want to be contributing to them. So towards the end, uh, we have one last comment from Dana. Um, can, uh, can Sam or Doris help to unmute him so that he can speak about the last questions and comment? Then Yao Hao, can you hear us? I think they said they can't unmute. Oh, oh, okay. If you're almost, okay, so I just read aloud for his comment and questions. So thanks so much, Lauren. Follow up on this question of different types of thinking raised earlier. I've been thinking about the way that learning to program can change the way we think, and I, I have this concern that this, at least sometimes, can be a one-way path. As we become more adept at certain ways of thinking, generalizing, formalizing, reducing, ambiguity that computers can't handle, etc., it becomes possibly harder to think in more associative or nuanced or poetic sorts of ways. And so I wonder if this is something you have thought about in relation to your work, which takes a very poetic approach, I think, to computation on the one hand, and in advocating for wider adoption of procedural thinking via projects like P5JS. Mm. <laughs> Good question. Um, I guess I would hope 
I would like to believe that um, when you learn these, I, I agree. I felt like when I learned to code, it really wasn't, uh, I don't mean to make it sound like exotic or so, or like, um, you know, very special or something, but it did feel like a different way of thinking, a, a different tool for thinking. Um, I guess I would like to believe that uh, these could be tools. They don't have to be, you know, reprogramming of your brain or, or like you said, like a one way path um, that we could have a lot of different tools and different ways for thinking. And I think I feel like as an artist, I'm doing that. Like there's definitely times where I'm like, okay, this is the thing I'm building and my brain goes into like code mode and I'm building out the architecture in my head. And there's other times where I'm like, that's not going to help me. I need to, you know, in, embrace and engage all the things that, um, you know, are not logical or maybe not even like linguistic, right? I need to kind of just be feeling for that intuition. And I think those are all different ways of, of thinking and relating. So I guess my hope is that, um, yeah, that it can be one of many tools and maybe it goes towards like, how are we teaching coding and how are we teaching um, that sort of thinking? You know, is it purely about the sort of technical logic based approach or, um, you know, I think of like the school for poetic computation where they're asking like, what does it mean to, to teach coding in a poetic way? Or what would it look like to integrate things like writing and art into um, a computer science curriculum, if that's where you're learning it. Um, yeah, so I guess that's my that's my hopeful answer. You know, I could, I, I feel like I can always give like a <laughs> more dystopian view of where it's going to go also. But thanks, Lauren, for your response and your time and for everyone also staying as well. So I'm afraid we have to finish uh, this first event of our symposium. I know it's already 10.30 uh, in Hong Kong time. So the next one, just to remind for the next one, will be on next month. Uh, 8.30 Hong Kong evening time by uh, Bitia and Yana and hope to see you all there and once again uh, thank you Lauren and thank you for everyone yeah thank you so much for having me